Welcome back to another edition of the Heart to Heart podcast. My guest today is returning guest, Dr. Ira Price. If you've listened to the show at all, you've definitely heard Dr. Price before. I think he's been on, I don't know if this is his fifth or sixth time, but uh, he's definitely been the most requested and uh, most um, listened to guests on this podcast. So Dr. Price, welcome to the show, brother. Wow, that's really nice. I didn't. I had no idea. I don't know why anybody really wants to listen to me. <laughs> I think it's just us. <laughs> no, man. Lots of people want to listen. To Even when I'm out for dinner with my, you know, relatives and stuff, like, yeah, you know, I really like that Dr. Price guy. So you got you got good reviews, man. You got good reviews. I think you put the two of us together and it's a problem. <laughs> That's what people like. People like problems. Uh, I think we're solving them, though, too. We're solving them, though, too. You know, so it's all good. Man, it's been uh, a while since I've chatted with you. How long has it been? Yeah, I, shoot. It's probably – and right, there's I, – I swear a little bit. But, you know, actually, before I say that, I'm going to try not – try no profanity today. It's That's okay. Like, it's okay if you swear. No, I, I – my, my, my admin staff's always giving me, you know. My, my mother and my sister <laughs> yelling at me <laughs> all the time. They've, uh, they've taken to the – you're going back to the swear jar. So I'm going to try as best I can not to do that. That is my thing now. I'm going to try not no profanity. It probably won't work, but whatever. Fuck it. Um, we'll figure it out. Yeah. So the last time we spoke, you know, it was probably, uh, it was before I went, went, uh, overseas to help. So it was, it was. Probably, yeah. And I went in October. So it was probably September was the last, it's been six, seven months, six months. It's a long time, man. It's yeah. a long time since we spoke. Sure. Has. Um, you look yeah. good. Thanks, brother. Always just trying to keep up the same regimen, doing the same things, you know, as usual. I'm trying um, to see if you have any gray hair in there now. Yeah, I'm getting a little bit of gray hair. I'm getting a little bit of gray hair. Maybe good. a little bit on my chin or something like that, but okay. not too much in my head yet. So that's good. That's why I wear a hat because my hairline keeps going back. I'm going, ah. to, I'm going to Turkey soon. I'm going to hit Turkey up and get some, <laughs> get an inch foot on. They, they've got so much in the back, but nothing in the front. I don't know. Yeah, those are the uh, they are the the best for hair transplants in the world, though, right? Turkey. They are. Yeah, they they seem to have perfected that process. I mean, they've got clinics. People take literally take flights, and they're just flights full of dudes just getting hair transplants. Yeah. Yeah. Well, man, if hair is important and if hair is important to you and it works, then I guess people got to do what they got to do. For sure it is. Yeah. I think it's important. Yeah. So you visited Israel in things. September. I mean, I went uh, in October. I wasn't, uh, wasn't more of a, wasn't really a visit. It was more of a, it was more to work. Actually, I was, um, I went and I uh, volunteered for an organization called Magenda Vida Dom, which is the National Ambulance Service in Israel. Okay. Yeah. It was a uh, pretty heavy experience. I went in October. It was uh, uh, the third week of October. So like literally like a week and a half, two weeks after the massacre happened. And and uh, I just couldn't sit here anymore. And I, so uh, I got the call to go. They needed help. And uh, there weren't many physicians at that time that were willing to go. So three of us came from, came from, came from Canada. Funny enough, they were all from our area. Like So I knew the other two docs that came with me. All from Hamilton? One from Hamilton, one from Burlington. Of all places in the world, like, uh, <clears throat> it was it, that of Canada, anyways. I mean, I guess Canada is not as huge as the United States or whatever, but the, uh, with population wise, but yeah, the physicians all, and specifically like from the Jewish population, Ontario is where like most of the, and Montreal is where most of the, the uh, Jewish population are. And so the, uh, the physicians that first were asked to go, were from Toronto, Montreal, and uh, and nobody really, really wanted to go at that time because there was so much uncertainty. So we got on a plane and went. Yeah. So you and two other two other docs, eh? So when you went over there, you know, what were you expecting, and what did you guys see? You know, first off, so like I think, you know, I haven't really spoken about it. You know, uh, I, I, don't, I haven't done any real posts about my, my experiences over there. 
or anything. So if I do happen to get emotional, which I usually don't, I stick it into the black box and everything stays there. Um, just we well, uh, can always edit things out too, anyway. So <laughs> I don't worry. care. Whatever it is what it is. Um, but I haven't really spoken much about it. To to be honest, I didn't want to. Even when I was, I got a call. I'll tell you what happened. I got a call on the Thursday. Uh, so what happened is after October seventh, like the the whole country went into panic mode. They they weren't expecting anything to happen from from the south. Israel, you know, as you know, is this tiny little country stuck, you know, in the middle of like, you know, uh, of an area of people that are just always trying to destroy it. And so they have a very like serious military. But there's two sides to you know there's two sides uh, within Israel that that have major areas. One is in the the major issues. One's in Gaza. And one's in the West Bank. Pro and West Bank is closer to uh, Lebanon, and that's usually where Hezbollah, which is like this other or terror organization, that's where they're mostly situated, and they're an actual true true fucking army. And so Israel's always been focused on that side, <clears throat> and so they were. What happened? I, I don't know. I, I I think as the uh, as the mist clears over time, we'll figure it out. But nobody was you know really super prepared for what was going on in the south, and so uh, when this and when this ma when the massacre happened, I think it rocked the entire Jewish world. And and I was sitting at home and. We were, and I'm not even like, fuck, man. I don't even, I haven't like spoken to like people, like Jews, my people in like years. I was like, I'm like as far removed as you possibly can get. But it affected us so, so deeply to know that this kind of crap still happens that I just couldn't sit still anymore. And that Thursday, I got a call from, um, the director, the, the national director of Magenda Vida Dom saying we need physicians to go and help out on the ambulances in the south. Which is where, uh, you know, where this, the, the massacre sort of took place, not sort of did take place. So I, I, uh, I got a call on Thursday and said, well, we need you on Monday. I'm like, what, what, what do you mean you need me on Monday? I got shifts. I got all this stuff going on. He's like, well, see what you can do for your shifts. See if you can get them covered for like two weeks. We just need you for a two week stint. Cause all of the, you know, as you know, Israel is a, uh, conscription army. So every citizen has to uh, participate in the military for three years. And so <clears throat> after they're done military, they're, they're civilians, of course, but they can always get called called back up to the reserves. And you're a reservist till you're like 40, 45 years old. And so a lot of the physicians would get called back up at that time. So physicians are missing from key areas of the general population out of hospitals, out of ambulances and all, and all those things. So I got so to that physicians who are in the army, who are now reserves, you know, they're not actually um, in the army right now, but they're practicing as physicians, whatever, or, you know, some other type of profession, they can actually be called from their profession as a physician back into the army. That's correct. That's insane. Every single person, like I mean, you know, look at even what happened with that. Uh, you did you ever watch that show Fauda? No. On on Netflix, uh, a, a great show uh, that shows like sort of like the tension between uh, Israel and uh, and uh, and Gaza and West Bank and the the conflict in like a nutshell. And it's kind of cool show. But even one of the actors got called back up, and he got his whole face almost blown off, like. Like these, wow. and, and he was like, he, he was like an operative on the show. And then he goes back into the military and he's an operative, like an actual dude. Like that's, you know, everybody can get called back up, you know, uh, until a certain age. Um, and so uh, physicians were getting called back up and they didn't know what was going to happen. I actually went before Israel uh, entered Gaza. So like they were still sitting on the line. There was no, there was just, you know, there was just missiles coming from Gaza, like thousands of them every day into Israel. And Israel was throwing up, you know, those rockets, the defense system to just stop them. And they hadn't really done much. They were, they were started in air. They started their air assault on Gaza uh, at uh, like just before I came, but there was no ground invasion into it. So I got called on the Thursday. There weren't many physicians who were willing to go. And, uh, and, and so I was like, you know what? Fuck it. Like, I can't sit here anymore and watch this, you know? 
Uh, so as a physician, I went and uh, on a mission, medical mission to uh, to work in the south uh, on uh, on an ambulance and uh, help out where needed. And so I, I, Thursday, I found out Sunday I was on a plane. Monday, I was working on an ambulance in the south. Uh, I was located in a place called Ashdod which is about 25 kilometers from the the Gaza border. It's in the uh, envelope there, they call it. So, uh, you know, the, uh, it was, it was a scary time. That's for sure. It was, it was really scary. Uh, you didn't know what to expect. I had no idea. I didn't know if I was going into like an absolute war zone or if I was going into work with civilians. Now I'm a Canadian, like I'm a foreign physician you know i'm like hopefully you're not putting me like in in uh you know in a war zone because that you know i don't think a volunteer organization or you don't want volunteers from canada getting you know blown up getting, getting blown up so so i i was i was replacing physicians that were you know in and we were stationed in different parts of uh of the uh you know, of the country in the South and they would just send us wherever we were needed. And so I don't speak Hebrew so well, um, as other people. And, uh, so I had to be with, uh, an English team and it just happened to be that the only guys that spoke English were like on the disaster team. So, uh, I would stay at the base until there was like a major call or a major, uh, disaster that would happen, or we would drive up to the border and pick somebody up and bring them back to the hospital, whether it was, and in Israel, they don't care who you pick up. It's not like you're picking up only Israelis. You're picking up Gazans. You're picking up Israelis. You're picking up terrorists. They don't care. Like medicine doesn't discriminate there. So like you can be one day treating, you know, a 10 year old kid, which we did, which is a crazy story. And then and I'll tell you about that in a second. And then the next moment, right next to them, there can be somebody that was just trying to blow themselves up and kill everyone else. Because there's no, like, they don't discriminate. Like, anything you see in the media is not really reality when you get there at all. And uh, so we were treating everybody, whether it was a terrorist or it was a, uh, uh, an Israeli or a soldier or a civilian, uh, Muslim, Arab, nobody cares. Like, when in medicine there, you treat who you got to treat and you move on. And so, so were there, were there any times where you felt like you were in danger? Like, were there any times you felt like you were in like an actual war zone or the, it's, you know, I, I don't post the photos or the videos, but like one night I'm standing on a balcony. I mean, this happened all the time. So the answer is yes. And it's very fucking weird. Like we're from here. Like we don't have bombs going off over our head. There's no missiles landing right next to us here. We live, we like, we live in a very thankfully, thank God we live in a very protected privileged country where we don't have missiles flying over our head, but I'd be like, and, and those missiles that come in from Gaza there, they don't care where they land. They purposefully try to get them to land as close to civilians or on civilians or on hospitals or on like paramedic stations that they, they care less. So I'm in the paramedic station. And you, so the closer you are to the south, to the border, the less time you have to get to a bomb shelter. So every station, there's a bomb shelter very close all the time, hopefully. So like when you're in, when I was in um, Beiri, which is very close to the border, you have seven seconds. When you say a bomb shelter, like, can you describe that? Like, what exactly is a bomb shelter? It's a fortified, like, uh, it's a fortified structure that has it within every apartment in Israel. Like civilian homes, every building, every house has one room that's dedicated as a bomb shelter. It's how crazy. Is it underground? It no, so they're most of them are overground. They're just like they're just like twelve inch thick walls, and it's dedicated as a bomb shelter. Like they're fortified, so hopefully the missile doesn't explode right on top of you and come through. But they're built so that. It, it can protect you from one missile anyway. Like there's no, there is no, they do not care. Like these guys, the, you know, the Hamas doesn't care where they drop the bombs. They're trying to kill people. And so every house, these guys live in constant fear, like every single day. And so I'm in a paramedic station. And so like I said, the closer you are to, uh, to the border, the less time you have to get to a bomb shelter. So, in Beiri, it's like seven seconds. 
they can't even launch the, you know, Israel has this defense system called the, what's the, the, the Iron Dome. And they can't even launch the Iron Dome into that area because they don't have enough time to, to launch it. It takes more than seven seconds. You need about 30 seconds. And then the next town over, you have, which is Ashkelon, you have 30 seconds. Where I am, you have about 45 seconds. So my first day, I'm, I'm walking in this medical, like in a, the paramedic station. And then, and you have these, uh, you have an app. And on your app, it tells you, like, they, they've, they've narrowed it down very well with technology as best they can in Israel. On the app, it will start, like, like you get these alerts, and it starts blaring whistle sounds, like, all over the place. And then there's sirens heard overhead. And then you have, like, so you're supposed to have, like, 45 seconds to get to this shelter. So everybody's running to the shelter. And this is day one. And it happened literally, like, every two hours, you're running to the bomb shelter. My first time, I'm like, is this actually real? Is this happening? And as I'm walking there, there was no 45 seconds. The whole building shakes. And this thing goes off right next door to it. And I'm like, are we okay? <laughs> like it, it's scary. It's, 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 it's super extremely scary. Cause they don't care. There's no warning. It's not like Israel says we're bombing X, get you a five minutes, 20 minutes. You have three days, get out. No, this just, these guys just drop these things wherever they possibly can. My first couple days there, like I would say every hour, every two hours, these things are going off. One night I'm standing on a balcony and, uh, and I'm looking up and I'm like, you remember like Atari, like back, like I never played. It was just, just after my time, I think. But like, you know, like space invaders and you see all these like, whoosh, whoosh, like little fucking, I know I'm not supposed to swear or whatever. You see all these like laser beams going off. One night I look up and all I see over my head are these, and I have these videos. I don't post them, but you have these laser beams that you think are laser beams, but they're missiles coming in from. Gaza and Israel sending up these like this really cool like uh, like anti missile like I don't know system that's literally just blowing them out of the sky and I'm looking up over my head and I'm like well this is real everybody's running for shelter and I'm taking a video because it's not real to us like we don't live that you're watching this happen in real time so you're watching the missiles um, be destroyed by the Israeli defense forces in real time. Yes, like thousands. And we're not talking like one or two. And they just keep on coming. Like, they'll just launch them from anywhere they can. Boom, boom, boom. And this, I always thought this Iron Dome was, I, to my ignorance, I thought this there was like an actual dome or like, I don't know. It's it's just like a missile-guided system that shoots down missiles that are attacking them. And so I was like, and so so it was scary. Like it was it was scary for for two weeks. By the second week, and I had to go into Beeri to pick up people. And you know, we were there with there was five physicians that came from France. Three of and there's two women and 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 three guys. The the three guys went home scared and left these two women there. And uh, and these I mean these women were like just just amazing. And one day she, one of them had to go out on a, on a call. And when you go, and this is just to civilian, we're seeing civilians. Like we go into the population cause we're, we're, we're taking over from the, uh, from the physicians or the medics who were called up and to go into theater. Right. So we're, we're behind the front line and there was no ground invasion yet. And so we're, we're just sitting, we're on the ambulances. One day, the, one of them has to go into a, uh, uh, into a house for a house call. And I don't know how paramedics are here, but there it's, 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 it, they're like mobile ICUs basically. And, uh, and so these guys are blaring their music on the way over to this house call. And like, they, they sing as they're going. And I guess it de-stresses them, but they didn't hear the siren going off overhead. And by the time they heard it, it was a little bit late and they literally have to just stop their car. Everybody wears like a, like a, a vest, you know, you wear a metallic, bulletproof vest and you have to wear this like helmet um were you wearing that i was anytime that i would get called to it depends so yes and it, if i was going past so where i was um in ashdod we were about 25 30 kilometers out from uh the uh, front line and when you go to ashkelon or if you go to the city 
more like the city uh, south of where I am and onwards, you have to wear it when like when you get, go to any call because you have no idea what's coming in. Like nobody's like, hey, let's figure, you know, nobody knows what's going on. So you wear it when you go into those areas and they give you it with your pack. So you're like carrying with it, you carry it with you. And so she's got this thing on. And she, you know, you just get out of, and she's from France. You go out of, you know, like there, again, they don't have bombs going off over their head. And, and like she gets out of the, out of the truck and she goes next to the, uh, you know, just right next to the truck. You put your hands over your head on the ground. I don't know what the hand, fuck your hands are going to help you if something lands on you. It's just a thing. And, uh, and the thing goes off right next to her and, and she comes back and, and she's super scared and it shook her like to her core. And like that's reality of what they, they're dealing with, you know, they're dealing with every single day. And this is before the ground incursion. And, uh, but people are still living their lives. Like it's, it's just so eerie. And it was so weird. Like Israel's so used to dealing with this over and over and over again that, you know, okay, it goes when off. When you say like back people to- are still like living their lives, you mean like people are still going to school, people are still going to university, people are still going to work. So like they just have, dinner at six o'clock or seven o'clock like everyone else but at some point at seven o'clock they may hear you know a bomb go off in the background but if they hear that bomb go off it's basically just part of everyday life and they don't necessarily don't make a big deal out of it but they understand that this is just their reality and they uh and they accept it is that sort of yeah so it's usually the sirens that will go off first thankfully israel like that that defense system catches like 98% of all of the, the missiles that are launched at them. Um, there's maybe 2% that it doesn't catch and that's where you get some devastation, but that, yeah, that's why they've put so much into a defense system, right? Israel's not an army. They're a defense force, right? That's why it's called the IDF is really defense force. They don't initiate war. They respond to attacks. That's, that's just what they've done throughout history. Um, and, uh, and so this defense system does that. So I'll be eating dinner Friday night, which is the, like every Friday night is the Jewish Sabbath and you know, people invite you to their house and you'll just be in the middle. All of a sudden, this thing goes off. You go into your bomb shelter room, you stay there for 10 minutes and then you come out and then you go back to living your life. And these people literally like, I was in a beach town. So it's a gorgeous beach town. Like Ashdod is stunning. It's like surfing and all the things you get. It's like Huntington beach basically. And uh, people are out there doing their things. Now, the first two weeks that I was there, like, so when I was there, there, everything was still, like, still closed. A lot of, I would say, you know, there's now about 500,000 Israelis that have been evacuated and displaced from their their cities and are living in uh, different places. So a lot of people were displaced at that time, and the beaches were all closed because the defense missiles. So, like, if you look at the, I know this isn't medical, but if, and I'll tell you an interesting story. If you look at the missile system that, you know, Hamas is using, they, they just, they're not guided missiles. These things are like, literally, they have like a, a missile head on them. They take the, they take the water pipe that Israel created for the, like, that, you know, that brings water to their civilians. They cut the water pipe out. They stick a missile head on it and they put a fan, like a motor on the back that's like this big, right? And so and then they just start launching them. And so these things cost them a hundred bucks. I don't know, probably nothing, whatever they take from the ground. And then the missile head, whatever it is, and they're supplied by other countries, you know, whatever to, to launch these missiles. It, so every time they launch them, it costs them a hundred bucks. Israel's missile costs 70,000 per missile. Like, you know, cause this is a guided significant like resource for them. So they don't stop every rocket. If it's going to land in a, on a, in a dune, or on a beach, they won't stop it. So they closed, they closed all the beaches while I was there, but people still go like people just live their daily lives. People were really sad. It was a really eerie time. I've been to Israel many times. I've lived in Israel before I've lived in Egypt before, and uh, I've lived in the Sinai. I like I've been, I've been to that area a lot and it's, it's gorgeous and it's stunning and people just want to live in peace. The majority of people like they don't want all of this war outside of Gaza or, or West Bank or any of that. So they just want to live in peace. Leave us the fuck alone. And the Bedouins, leave us alone. Like, you know, Israel's a multicultural center. You've got Christians, Muslims, Jews, everybody lives there. And these guys just want to live in fucking peace. 
And, and it makes it really hard. So when I was there, these guys, like it was depressing. Like you'd go out for dinner. The restaurants are still open. People are, you know, but usually it's hustling and bustling. But now imagine like this is the largest massacre of Jews for the sake of being Jewish, you know, of civilians since the Holocaust. And these guys are, and, and they're hurting. They were hurting really, really bad. The government let them down. You know, even the, the, the Israeli government is uh, just totally let everybody down for the first five days. There were nowhere, like nowhere to be found. I know nobody wants to hear that over there, but that's true. And I don't know how something like that even happens, but it doesn't excuse the behavior of what of a massacre of what happened. But it, uh, in any sense of the meaning, but why, why, you know, where was the preparedness for something like this? I mean, it's hard to prepare for people just launching themselves into into a festival when a peace festival of all things, you know, to start like I went to uh, a hospital. These hospitals, by the way, are gorgeous. They're like, how long have you been back, though, now, Ira? I came back in the like beginning of November. Being in November. So, like, you know, now I've seen, though, unfortunately, there's been a lot of anti Semitism amongst the medical community, even in Canada. Like, yeah. I've seen several doctors speak out against it. Um, there's a guy on Twitter, uh, Dr. Jacobs, I follow quite a bit, and he's been pretty vocal about it as well. Um, you know, is that something that you've experienced? Like, we know that, you know, you had a horrific experience in, um, in Israel and like we commend you for going there and helping out all those people. But what's it been like since you've been back in Canada and have there been any anti-Semitic remarks or have there been any, um, have you had any issues at all? I, I, I can't get into specifics. Um, um, it's hard to answer that question. So the answer is yes, but the, but it's also, it's also, um, if I point it out to, you know, I, I don't want to create any, any issue, further issues than have already been created Understood. from this. I, what I could say is there, you know, some colleagues, um, I think people are misguided and, uh, you know, there are other the physicians that go to Gaza and Israel is like, has literally, you know, destroyed that region and there are physicians that work in those hospitals over there the problem is those hospitals are full of terrorists and have have tunnels built all over them and israel's in a really really tough position and it is a hu humanitarian crisis there is no way around that no way to deny that people are dying left right and center over there and it is just an awful an awful time to be there right now and uh, which, you know, like all things are temporary, but it, it looks like a massive, and not just looks, it is a massive humanitarian crisis, but there's, there's a reason for it. And there's a, a very simple way to end this, to end this crisis. And that is Hamas stops doing what they're doing and they return hostages, most of whom are already dead now, but they don't talk about all that stuff. And uh, I've experienced so much here. I think most people now know to leave me alone because, uh, especially on my social media, good luck. And, uh, I used to engage with them, but I'm no longer here. Like I can't stop stupid. And, uh, most people as Napoleon Hill points out are, you know, drifters, 98% of the world is sleeping. And uh, I don't know if you ever read that, that book, um, outwitting the devil. Okay. And, no, uh, I know it's his big one is, um, you think and grow rich, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, but he, he wrote another one. It took about 70 years before he died to publish this thing. Uh, it's excellent, actually, if you have a chance to, to, to read it. And so I no longer try to engage with them. Uh, my problem is that you have these alt-left, DUI, DIU, DU, do it all yourself, whatever those guys are called. And uh, what is it, DU? I know that's I'm drunk and sure. driving. You know, like where you – Yeah, yeah. What's that? DIY? DIY? No, DIY? DIY is do it yourself. Yeah. So, but it's something like that. You know, like yeah. the. I'm not familiar with like the yeah, left. The, you, I mean, I just. No, know but you know those guys that are saying like, yeah. you know, di um, equality and and all yeah. this stuff. Um, D. D uh, shoot. Anyway, whatever it's called. I, I think they're, you know, they're like, do it. They're all about this equality unless you disagree with them. And when they, you know, and when you disagree with them, they're going to like intifada on you. They're literally like, 
uh, Antifa, Antifa, like all these guys are all part of that. And these guys literally just want to disturb people's peace. I, I, I don't think there, I don't think there's any other way to express that the world is in a crisis right now, a moral crisis. Uh, and, uh, and they're blind. People have, we live in, we live in a very privileged society where, um, we're thankfully we live in a, a pre we've for our whole lives, we've lived in a pre war, sorry, in a post war society where war wasn't a thing on our minds, but we've now switched to this pre war mentality in around the world. Cause we're always in a preparation phase. These, this, this is really like, we're like precipice of a major world disaster or major world war. So the, the world is shifting and I don't think people appreciate what that means or what that entails and how, and, and I think they just want to live in, in this, in, in a world of denial of reality and, uh, and hate. Yeah. I, I know so what hate. you mean. There's, there's a lot of, I agree. There is, you know, people talk a lot about depression and anxiety and mental health disorders, but I think though, and obviously, you know, anger is a symptom of uh, depression, but there is a lot of anger I find that's going on in the world these days. And I think that people are, you know, trying to attach themselves to some type of cause or some type of, of thing because it makes themselves feel better. Everyone wants to feel important. Everyone wants to feel part of a group, but sometimes that group, you know, may not be the best thing for you. And sometimes that group may not have a very good message. And I think that if you are, you know, feeling lonely or if you're feeling, you know, depressed and then someone comes along and sort of like teaches you about a certain group, you know, whether it is, you know, uh, someone trying to groom someone, you know, their sexual orientation or something like that, then you have to be, you know, very, very careful about that and understand and recognize what's going on. And it's hard yeah, for I mean, mental health. It is. It's very, if, very difficult. You know, people that suffer mental health, and I look at that guy that just lit himself on fire and uh, and and died in protest or whatever, he, you know, who suffered significant mental health, and I feel awful for him and his family, the, you're, I think you're open to, to suggestion so much easier when you suffer because you are, you're looking for connection. You're looking to put yourself into a situation where you feel any sort of oxytocin release, right? And you're looking for that. And if you find a group of people that, that are like minded to you, that connection is what, and I mean, it's like any addiction. Right. Like, yeah. opi like we're all people are searching for that connection because it releases those neurochemicals. You feel, you know, your oxytocin, your serotonin, everything is a lot aligned. And people who suffer significant mental health and don't have those connections to begin with, look for them. And sometimes they look for them in all the wrong places. Yeah. So that actually is a really good point, because uh, I think it was um, I forget the guy's name who said that the opposite of uh, addiction is is connection. And I do understand that. But the other part of that, too, is that if you like Michael Easter, for example, as he was on Rogan, he said, you know, had a little bit of a rebuttal to the, you know, the opposite of connection is addiction, because he said that when he was drinking all the time, he had lots of drinking buddies, right? So he was certainly connected to people who were drinking. But what you want to do is you want to be connected to people who are on the same wavelength as you who are progressing in the right direction, right? Because if you're just drinking with someone that's not necessarily a real connection sure you're you know you're with someone else and that may make you feel better temporarily in the meantime but we know what alcohol does to people and we know what you know alcoholic you know circles do to people those people likely aren't probably going to motivate or initiate you know any kind of you know good things in your life productivity yeah what they want to do is just make sure that you're drinking like them and a lot of times it's that they can make themselves feel better you know if someone has a drinking problem it makes themselves feel better if they know that they have someone else has a drinking problem right where if someone else doesn't have a drinking problem and they do then they're going to feel a lot more shame and they're going to feel worse about themselves so you know you do have to be careful about you know um you know joining the wrong group of friends hanging out with the wrong group of people and then also you know being pulled down into their habits well they're fi you're finding like a common ground you're fin finding a commonality and that commonality be so instead of it revolving around your own self-worth it's revolving around an external factor and that external factor in this case would be alcohol or drugs or something of that sort where 
our own, and you know, I think Gabor Mate talks about it. I'm not like a huge fan these days, but the uh, the idea of figuring out what your own self worth is and realizing that you don't have to, it's not an external factor that is going to bring you happiness, but your own internal yeah. happiness that comes from that, that, that comes from within, from understanding yourself and having, you know, and growing up with, uh, or, or dealing with your own trauma versus putting it away. I think one of the most important things that we forget as humans is that we have to always continuously want to grow. And I think most people, and I didn't realize this, actually, this was a eureka moment, like one of those aha moments for me where I was talking to somebody and they're like, why, you know, and they're like, oh, I'm listening to this uh, guru or this like life coach, you know, and they're telling you to, you know, make sure when you wake up, you do something like positive and blah, blah, like they have all, everybody has all of these, you know, the, you know, step one, step two, do all these little tips to feel better and all this stuff. And I'm thinking in my head, like, did nobody grow up being self-reflective? Like, was nobody taught? It was ingrained into me from a little kid to be self-reflective. And I think that has been lacking in our world. So we find this, and I didn't know that. I thought everybody just naturally would be self-reflective and, and want to grow. But people don't know that they need to do that and work on themselves. So they look for all these external factors to help them do that when really those answers really come from within, from when you're a kid moving, you know, growing up and that really creates a lot of trauma if you don't have that opportunity. So uh, like that was a, a moment for me where I think, you know, when a lot of the world is lacking is self insight. Yeah. They don't want to, they don't want to get better. They don't want it to improve. And no. if you are around people who also don't want to improve, then it's going to be very difficult for, for you to improve because that's not going to be the environment for you right and then the other part about that is like i saw um a click of um a clip of uh leah hermosi alex hermosi's um wife I'm not sure if you know who she is but she said that i don't know when it was exactly but she said there was a period of her time in her life where she you know didn't have too many close friends unfortunately she said that like you know she wasn't with uh on, on the same wavelengths as his friends that she used to be on but she's not quite grown enough yet to have been able, I'm not sure how she worded it, but maybe to be able to attract or be with the people that like she wants to be with. So she had to go through this sort of like rough, like growth stage, you know, and that does sound, you know, pretty rough. You know, I, um, I, I would find it hard. I think if I, you know, felt very, very lonely at a certain time in my life, but I do think that for some people in certain situations, you know, if you are going through that particular period, I think that is just part of the process and you probably are on the right track even though you think that you're not because it's hard for you to connect with other people as long as you're thinking about it 98 percent of the world don't think like that most of the world doesn't think what is going to make me a better person today well most of the world is i'm going to connect to something else an external factor and be codependent on that because that's what releases my oxytocin neurochemically we feel that connection to external. The question is, can you do that on your own? I think this is where psychedelics come into the into play quite heavily because that gives you a sense of self potentially, and it releases those. You know, it helps you release your own neurochemicals without relying on external factors, which is why I think you know psilocybin lasts six to eight weeks. If you you know do or like not sorry, not the high, but or like the experience. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the the antidepressant effects or the effects of it can last so long. Because it teaches you to rely on yourself and internal factors more than these external factors. And that's to, empowering. It's empowering, right. And most people are not self-reflective. So if you give them the opportunity to be self-reflective, then, you know, and, and they're not, uh, let's say I'm the general public for the most part that suffers depression and they're on these SSRIs, which we know, I mean, we've looked at the studies and there's that big meta analysis in 2022 that it has nothing to do with fucking serotonin. And uh, right, but at the same time, though, it, like I understand that meta analysis that came out in in 2022, but it doesn't necessarily mean that they don't work at all. It just it just means that there are likely some downstream factors that they're um, maybe potentiating that could be effective again i'm not I, I i totally get it there's lots of people who try antidepressants and they get no relief from them whatsoever but some people do find that 
they get some kind of relief with them. Like I can't, you know. Yeah, no, there are, there are. But if you, I mean, if you look at our highest, I agree. Level, if I you agree. look at our highest, if you look at a hierarchy of evidence, right, from uh, expert opinion to observational trials to random uh, to cohorts to randomized control trials to meta analysis to uh, to clinical guidelines, that's the pyramid of evidence. Uh, you know, uh, meta analysis is the you know second highest level of evidence with uh, you know to show us that there's really not now the, is everybody are millions of people on SSRIs? Of course, does it help in some people? Sure, you know, do I think that you know psilocybin and psychedelics have a larger potential to help? I do, and I think it's because it turns people in, into themselves and helps them identify their own problems without relying on external factors. Yeah, I think that for for antidepressants, I think what it does for some people is yes, there is a little bit of you know a numbing effect. To it, it numbs them. That's people, what it does. It right? just numbs yeah. you. That's what it, it does. It, it doesn't deal yeah. with the issue. Deal I, with I source. Think, I think what it is so a normal human being, you know, uh, on a very simple level, can feel from zero to ten. You know, if you're taking an antidepressant, um, I don't think unfortunately you're going to be able to get to. A 10. I mean, maybe you can sometimes. Um, I'm not speaking for everybody on this, but I think that, you know, if you are on it, you may not have these crazy highs anymore. You may not be able to get to a nine or a 10. You know, maybe you'll still be able to get to a seven or an eight, something like that. Um, but I think it does take away for some people, I guess, you know, sure. the lows. This is just sort of my observation as a clinician. I'm not like, you know, citing any studies on this, you know, this hasn't been, you know, research that people who, you know, take antidepressants can't reach a 10 out of 10 and, you know, subjective um, wellness or well-being, you know, I'm just kind of spitballing here off of my clinical experience. But I think that some people just accept Which it, is like, important. Okay. I'm never going to, you know, feel like a nine or a 10 or a 10 out of 10, which is kind of sad, but I'm willing to, you know, take this medication so I don't feel like less than a four or less than a five, you know, and I think that's what antidepressants do. Um, How many and, meds are they on though, right? So you, you yeah. will start with one, then they're on three, and then they're on six, exactly. and then they're exactly. on nine, and then by the end, they're on an antipsychotic, an SSRI, an SNRI, Abilify for like the, uh, it's not working, so I'm going to stick them on Abilify, and it, you know, it, it's it's hard. I, like I'm, It I'm, does become, yeah, that, that addition of like adding and adding and adding does you know, it, it comes up quickly. People, you know, once you stay, when you, once you take one medication, it's easier to take a second. Once you take a second, it's easier to take a third and just kind of snowballs. I, I'm not, I'm not minimizing the use of, of, um, antidepressant SSRI. SSRIs or antidepressant medications or, you know, anything of that. Like, I'm not saying that there isn't a place for them. I, I what I'm saying is I think that we have, a better alternative or an alternative that is showing itself to be more beneficial and, uh, and which is in the, uh, in the psychedelic realm. And we just need to get to that finish line. And I think it'll change our understanding of mental health in general. And I think that bringing it back to the point where you see these mobs of people and, uh, uh, and mob mentality, is are these people that are relying on these external factors that aren't doing the critical uh, appraisals or analysis of themselves and they're just relying on external factors for their their own satisfaction and uh and if you rely on other people to bring you happiness you're fucked you are i agree 100 percent with that statement and and i'm seeing a lot of i'm we see a lot of that now like and and don't get me wrong, there is a massive humanitarian crisis. People are just and people are just misguided. They don't understand. They don't live in that region. I'm bringing it all back now. The the you know, am I going to say everybody has a mental health issue? No, I think people don't have a self insight issue, or people have a self insight issue. I don't. I think people are not critical, uh, I, I, you know, are critical evaluators, and they rely on the, you know, social media is not meant to be a news outlet it has turned into that um you know unfortunately it's had to turn into that because we can't it's trust. had to turn into that because, because the, you get right. better trust online on x than on cnn or right. cbc right. right so you can't trust you can't trust uh, msm you can't we know we can't we it's like trusting big pharma same idea like these guys <laughs> all have you know whatever but if you look at if you look at social media it doesn't say you know post your ideas you know it's comment 
It, it doesn't say let's have a discussion. It says post a comment. It's not a discussion board. It's a comments board. So people just throw out their comments. It's not a way to gather, you know, to, to gather real information. It's just you're getting snippets. The 30 second say whatever the fuck you want and then somebody else say whatever the hell they want. And it's not like a, a good way to, to disseminate in, information for humans. I don't think humans were meant to consume as much information as we are. I agree. And they're like everywhere we look, our brains are overwhelmed. And, and it leaves us with a big problem. Like when, and it can lead to a, and it leads lead, that with one of the reasons I think we have this large increase in mental health currently. I thought, I mean, lots of reasons, but it's because we're consuming so much information and it's so hard to discern, discern truth. And it can play a physical, effect on somebody i'll give you a story of what happened in israel actually but just before you go into yeah. that what you're saying though is so on point because like you know dr phil said a major point the other day when he was on joe rogan and he said that he thinks that the advent of the smartphones and social media has a, just as big of an impact on human history as the industrial revolution right so so you know until the industrial revolution i think there was only about a billion people in the world now we're up to like almost 8 billion or something like it's it's wild so obviously that's had a dramatic effect on uh, on human population and growth and on uh, society in general but also too like smartphones i mean you know for centuries we weren't looking at phones now everyone is staring looking down at a screen all the time like that's a gigantic change in society like it's completely transforming our society how we interact how we behave how we feel about other people and you know i do think that we should like i just it just craves that there was no safeguards in place very first i don't think we knew what it was going to do and i think that if we had done something initially then maybe we would you know, we wouldn't be in the situation that we are in now, but like, what are we going to do now? Like take kids phones back, like get rid of social media, like ban social media. Like it seems like there's no real solution to this. Well, you know what I find interesting is we live in the safest time in history. The less we have less death now per capita than we've had in the entire history of the world. Right. You go back to the Middle Ages and hundreds of them where you didn't have millions of people, billions of people, but you had hundreds and thousands of people. Hundreds of them would die every single day. And we didn't need to stare at death every day because you didn't know what was going on in England, didn't know what was going on in, in you know, in Canada or wherever. We didn't have Canada, but like whatever, North America. We didn't know what was going on in France, didn't know what's going on. It took six weeks to get a, a note from uh from by a boat from france to to england saying oh yeah there was a big massacre that happened here and you couldn't comprehend you didn't have to comprehend the minute to minute play of dead bodies lying all around you it took you a lot of time to get that information we actually live in the safest part time in history but if you actually look at social media it would tell you you live at the darkest moment in history which we don't Right. If we looked at the Holocaust, let's just go back a hundred years, and we had and we had people with their cell phones looking at Auschwitz, Treblinka, Majdanek, uh, you know, Dachau, all these places where millions of people were being murdered every single day, and you had Dresden being bombed from the top, and you had you know France being bombed from the bottom, Poland being overrun, and we had cell phones to show. You would have no idea who's right or who's wrong. We, you know, bec because all you're seeing is death and we're, as humans, our brain is not conditioned to look at, at least for the most part. I mean, as a physician and as a coroner, maybe we, it takes time. It take, took me 12 years to work as an independent physician. We're not meant to just do it overnight. And that leads to a lot of mental health. That leads to a lot of confusion, leads to a lot of answers. It leads to a lot of people. I don't know. Have you ever read The Coddling of the American Mind? Excellent, excellent book that I think. Jonathan Haidt. No, I haven't yeah, read it, but I know a little bit about it. Fantastic. He talks about like, you know, these three falsehoods uh, in the world. One being the safetyism and the fragility of, of humans and, uh, and the fallacy that we have to protect them more now than we ever have. There is less, less um, you know, um, kidnapping now than there's ever been. There's less death now than there's ever been. These things happen. We just think there's so much more of it because we have access to it 24 seven. Yeah. And that's causing 
a lot of problems for us. But not only that, even just technology on its own. Great. I'll give you this story. I know I don't know if you if if you have a moment, but I'll tell you about a story that happened in Israel. It was all over the newspaper. I happened to be called to 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 it. So an alarm rings. And this is how the physiology of the human psyche can affect the or how the human psyche can actually literally affect your heart. Um there's a you remember I was telling you that there's a you know if there's a, a bomb alert like there's a missile incoming you get these sirens that go off so as the sirens going off I get a call that comes in it's a 10 year old girl that's collapsed and uh, this is a civilian so this is we're going to a civilian neighborhood but it's the the uh, it's in the middle of an alarm so you put all your kit you put all the head jet all the stuff on and you head over to the house. And it's a family of Georgian refugees. So in Georgia, there was a lot of massacring happening in Georgia. You don't hear about this stuff, and you don't care about it because it's not on your social media every day. But there was, you know, a while back, a, a lot of Georgians escaped, and they came to Israel. And uh, so you have a family of Georgians, and this one 10-year-old girl collapsed at the sound of the alarm. And uh, her heart stopped beating. Uh, you know, there's something called, like, broken heart syndrome, Takiyatsu's, um uh, broken heart syndrome, and you can release like all these. Uh, you can have like a full anticholin, like all your catecholamines in your heart can deplete, and your heart can just stop. These things happen, and we worked on her for like we just didn't want to. So actually, thanks to one of the other paramedics there, she's like, we are not stopping. Eventually, we we got her back. Uh, she passed away probably about a week or two later, but um, uh, we worked on her probably for about two hours, and her heart stopped at the siren, at the sound of a siren. And that just, you know, and to me, what that tells you is like, look what technology, look what these things can physiologically do to you. You know, just the sound has enough impact to stop your heart by causing yeah, catecholamine. So it's crazy. So imagine what just looking at your phone all fucking day can do to you. So I think, I mean, whether I'm not a, like a believer in over, in, you know, over regulation, I don't know the answer. I think a lot of it starts with your family. You know, uh, limiting your time on social media to your children, teaching them to be critical. A lot of these things aren't taught to people. They're not because they're taught to sit in class and raise their hand. You know, that those don't give you the life skills that you need to survive in our world anymore. Yeah, I agree. I agree. There's uh, a lot that needs to be done with the education system and the smartphones. Like, I don't know what they're going to do, though. Like, if they're just going to ban them or what they're going to do because it seems like we've come so far and just to take them back would be you know um it just seems like it's not a viable option i guess at this point education you know? man whose responsibility is it uh, i'm not like us i'm not a prohibitionist like at all you know um same way i don't think drugs should be illegal i don't you know people can have access people should have access but people should also if they can't like People also have to be given the skills and taught the skills on how to deal and manage with the things that are in front of them. And it's not just, you know, we live in the safety world, like let's not give kids peanuts anymore because one kid's allergic to peanuts, so nobody gets peanuts. I, I don't believe in that mentality. And I know it, like it just that's another fallacy, you know. We're not fragile people. We have the ability to cope with a lot, but we have to have the tools to be able to do it. And we weren't meant to do it in the way that we are. I don't think anyways, medically speaking. No, I, I agree with you in the, you know, the part you said about the siren, you know, affecting that little girl's heart. It just shows you how dramatic and how much an impact technology can have on our physiology and on our health. Um, I know we only have a few minutes left and I wanted to ask you just a little bit. About the about the ERs in Ontario. So, what's going on with the ERs in Ontario? Oh my god, it's such a it's a disaster, bro. Like, so the, our departments are a disaster. You know, there's no I know say pre COVID, post COVID, I, they've been a disaster since 2012. Like, you know, I remember coming into work 2005, 2006, and we could you know clear out a department even in tertiary care centers. There's 40 people waiting at any any given time. Our province is bro in Ontario. Our province is broke. They're still cutting funding. You know, they're cutting funding to our hospitals, to our resources. They're still taking away nurses out of our emergency departments when we are when we're already overwhelmed. And we don't have the budget for it. We don't have this. We don't have that. Okay, but 
do you, you understand that we had the budget? What happened to all of that budget? You know, where did all that money co- go when, when, when we had, let's say, when COVID was around? Where, what happened to all the extra beds we were supposed to get? Well, we don't have staffing. You know, I saw this really interesting article that said, oh, we've hired 30,000 more staff, more nurses in Ontario. Okay. How many fucking left? 50,000, you know, leaves us with, you know, with, with a massive deficit. We are so over governed governed for every patient in the ho- or managed for every patient in the hospital in Ontario we have six managers like that's unheard of most people are one to two one to three we're one to six one to eight the this it needs to change our wait times are hours and hours funding still not there the care is you know which which plays a big factor on care now I'll tell you the people who are there are there working their tails off you know the emergency docs the emergency nurses Emergency room is like I've said before, a microcosm of the world. You can see what's happening are, are, in the world. Are ER docs quitting? Oh yeah, I, they are quitting. But I'm I'm burnt out. Like I, I'm I know I've only worked nights for fifteen, almost fifteen years. I don't recover. I'm sick. I'm seeing you know we're seeing twenty five, thirty patients. Some are seeing fifty patients a night. Like even in small little hospitals. Yeah, we've like they've they've had enough, man. Like uh, it's something needs to change, and and you know, are, are ER fun, nurses quitting? Like by the truckloads, I don't. You know, I'll go back to I work in a few hospitals. I'm not going to mention where they are, but I'll go back to uh, one of my other hospitals. And I don't recognize a single nurse. The turnover right now is so. Why would you want to work in a one to eight? capacity where you have one nurse to like eight patients and hallway medicine everywhere when you can go work in a, a clinic and just get paid the same amount like yeah i mean, I mean and- that's what that's what my fiance does like emily like she she works in a methadone clinic right and so she just has daytime hours where she sees methadone patients does her urines and yeah you know, she doesn't have to get spit on every day we get spit on yeah. i get yelled at we're abused like constantly i love my job i mean i think i was cut out for working emerge but it's it's getting to the end. The reason I don't work day shift is because I just you know me and management don't usually go hand in hand, <laughs> and I like yeah. to keep up my skills. But it's tough now. The fun like where our province is is broke. It's and it's wild it's too how mess. busy the walk-in clinics are right now. Like I saw a uh, article the other day that said that the average wait time at the walk-in clinic has actually doubled in Ontario, and so like. It's it's wild. Like I will go to work sometimes at nine o'clock and at eight fifty. Like the I counted the other day, there was fifteen people in February in Canada, like waiting outside the clinic just to get in. Right? Like it is wild. Like I'll start a shift, like literally at like two o'clock. Sometimes we'll have to close the doors at like two thirty because yeah. there's already forty to fifty people there, and I'm like. I can't see more than 40 to 50 people in these four hours. Like it's just not right. like possible. Yeah. Um, so, you know, you guys got to close the doors, you know, and then people get upset and it's like, well, like, what am I supposed to do here? Like, you know, I can't split myself in half. Um, you know, I'm only one person and, you know, I'm trying to do my best between trying to see people quickly and efficiently yet still provide them with, you know, some kind of high quality healthcare. You know? How many of those patients that are coming to see you have family physicians probably it's a good question it might be 50 percent. it might be you know less but the other part of that too like we talked about before is that they can't get in to see them no family doctors are still not seeing their patients and then you have a got a cold oh if there's flu-like symptoms don't come see me go to your go to your local emergency department so they're they're busting down the doors with colds and flus. Like, I think there's a lot of education that needs to be done. A lot of people were scared, like really scared after COVID, you know, because they were told they were all going to die. So you get a cold and a flu, flu and, and all of a sudden everybody thinks that, you know, they're, they're really, they're going to die. And now there's measles going around because nobody's getting, you know, the regular vaccines people are getting and measles is like, there's a, 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 a measles outbreak. And, uh, you know, the even preventable diseases, people are just like, the departments are overwhelmed. The medicine I saw it too. Like, um, I had Dr. Ramsey Hijazi. I don't know if you know who he is on, uh, you know, maybe a month or two ago, maybe it was a little bit more. I'm not sure. Yeah. Anyways, he's a physician out of, uh, Ottawa. 
Um, he created this, I think he was the creator of the union of, of college of family physicians of, uh, of Canada or Ontario, something like that. And anyways, um, he quit recently, you know, he quit his family medicine job and now he's becoming a hospitalist. And, uh, you know, he just said, it's, you know, it's just too difficult. The works, the working conditions are just too poor. You know, people are, uh, staffing is, is, you know, a major issue in medicine now as it always has been, but you know, it's getting worse now trying to pay people, you know, a decent wage. It's so hard. Can, yeah. How do you, how do you keep it's a cool. clinic going where you have, you know, the, our, uh, the amount of money that I earned in 2014 was probably like 1.25 compared to what I'm earning now with the inflation rates going through the roof. Physicians aren't, aren't, aren't getting, uh, aren't getting any raises or there's no increase in our, in our pay. It's actually gone down significantly. And, uh, it, it's just, it's just so hard. And if you have a clinic, I, I know people say, oh, physicians must be so wealthy. Okay. But you have like, you have, you know, three nurses and you have a whole walk-in clinic with all the equipment at the end of the day. Why would anybody want to do that here? It's really yeah. t- like, yes, our number one reason for working in medicine is because we want to give back to the world. I think there was a calling that we had that, you know, that said we want to help and treat, but we also have to, you know, wellness and mental health is really important. And the burnout rate, like you mentioned, is tremendous right now. We're, you know, physicians are, are, are dropping out. Nurses are quitting. Resources are less than they've been. And uh, they're saying, oh, well, you know, the, the excuses that men could come up with over and over again, you know, they say, well, we need to throw more money at it. You need, no, it's not just throwing money. It's, there's a whole process, you know, uh, oh, you need more staff. Well, you don't just need more staff. We need more beds. We don't just need more beds. It's, it's a process. And we started with the system was, the, the, I'll tell you one thing. The system was designed to fail. It's not what about, like, I just, let, let me ask you one, one quick question though, because yeah. I know that there's a lot of people who are applying for medical school who are not now applying for family for family. They don't want to be family doctors. So everyone who's a medical student, when they go through the CARMS match or when they're applying to be, you know, a family doctor, a specialist, um, they're not choosing family. Are people choosing ER? Is that also going down? So it's interesting. Uh, you know, family medicine, they're trying to make into a three year program from the, oh, two are they? yes, from the two that it's at. Like imagine that. So instead of now being a two year program to go practice family, it's three years. They're just going to go plummet, plummet down, you know, in like the amount that we already have a hard time getting fam- people becoming family docs. Emerge is still a very highly, um, coveted spot in, it is? in the okay. country. Yeah. Uh, and that's because it, it does, at the end of the day, offer um, a good life. You know, people don't realize that, like, you know, you're not taking home your problems, hopefully. Like, you don't have to take your patients home, you know, uh, is is not a bad is not a bad thing. That's a big bonus to ha- to to our career is my patients. You know, I don't have a roster of patients that I have to worry about every single day. I see new things all the time. It's changing all the time. And then I come home and I do something else. Uh, so I could shut my brain off, which is important, but I, you know, I don't know. It, it, it's not high up on the lucrative scale. So, um, but, but it is, but it is good though, that, you know, people are still interested in becoming ER docs. I, I right don't know. Not, to be honest, don't know. I don't, I don't know the statistics on it. I know like at least in the last, you know, few years when I was involved with CARMS and involved with residency, but it was pre COVID stuff. Pre COVID was pretty big. I don't know what's happening now. Okay. Yeah, I know that for with family medicine, everything is way down. No one wants to be a family doctor anymore. Not. Why um, would you? So hard. But I don't know about ER, but I got a feeling that, you know, people are probably not going to be into ER medicine now as well. And I think that a lot of people are really just, you know, I understand it and I'm interested in it too, but a lot of people are just kind of into like regenerative medicine or, you know, they want to do anti-aging stuff or basically they want to do something where they don't have to work as hard and can make, you know, a boatload of money. I think that's what a lot of quality of life is important. Are trying to get into. Yeah. Quality of life is important. Yeah. I think that that's, yeah. And, you know, and, uh, and, you know, I'm not, you know, shitting on those docs, like more power to them in some ways, but at the same way, like, you know, the gap is not being filled you know, and there's consequences to this. And when you yeah. have people who are 
don't want to be family doctors who are working less, who are, you know, quitting like the, you know, fellow I just mentioned, Dr. Ramsey, um, Hijazi, like, you know, it's going to cause some, some consequences. And, you know, I don't really know like what the solution is to it. Like, like I literally don't know if they're going to say like, if you, if you're a family doctor now, you have to work, you know, so many hours, like in a clinic or you have to see so many patients, but it's, uh, you know, if, if we have no family doctors or very few family doctors, like they are going to have to do something. Well, you know? you know, I think we have, we have a lot of empty spots every year for family medicine. It's always the same. We also have a lot of international medical grads that aren't given any opportunity here, which really, which is really unfortunate. We can fill the gaps. We just need to have the responsible government to want to fill those gaps and take on the tough questions. There are people that would go into family medicine. Listen, I, the family medicine is super lucrative. You've got family docs that roster 2,000 patients and then see four patients a day, 10 patients a day. They don't have to see more because they get paid whether they see their patients or not. If you're on a roster, you know that, you're family doc. You know how many patients I see some days? Right, because you're fee-for-service, so you have to work to see your patients. Those guys do not. And so they, you know, they, and now the question is, you know, time with patient and pay versus, you know, uh, quality of care. These are all very tough questions. So the amount of pay a physician gets paid to the time they spend with the patient, to quality of care, these are all important questions. And, but our system was designed flawed and you're going to end up with the outcomes we have because our system was designed that way. It was designed to fail. I can see 200 patients a week, like all the time. Like, yeah, you, but you, know, you can, but yeah. you, you, because you choose to do that. You care about your patients. You want your patients to be seen. But a lot of docs work three days a week in their clinic and they see 20 patients a day. Yeah. Because they have 2,000 rostered patients. So then they all come to the emergency departments. The acuity has also gone up. Our acuity has gone up significantly in our emergency departments post COVID. Uh, why that is, I'm sure it's multifactorial like everything else is, but we need to, we need to overhaul medicine, our uh, healthcare, and repeal the, you know, I say we repeal the, the healthcare act then and rewrite it. But the, that, that won't happen because there's no government, govern, no politician who will want to take on medicine. It's political suicide. Um, I want to chat with you for longer, but I know that yeah. we're out of time. All right. So, um, anything else we can, you, you can leave with people with your take and tell them where they can follow you on Instagram and all that kind of stuff. I, I do want to end on a positive note and say, you know, all, all things are temporary, right? And there is hope and we should continuously have the, um, we should never give up hope that things are going to get better. It's when you start giving up hope that you fall into a dark, dark place. Uh, and there's a lot of really good things in the world and there's a lot of really amazing advancements. Uh, and if you keep your community tight and uh, you really look into yourself, I think things will start looking better. It's just right now we're going through a dark period, but that, that, that will end. It's always darkest before the light, right? Yeah. Beautiful so. message to, to end uh, the podcast and let people know where they can follow you online as well. Yeah. So Dr. Ira, Dr. Ira, Ira price on uh, Instagram. And I have a website, uh, Doc, DRIRAPrice.com. You can check me out there. It's actually just on my Instagram. Probably the best place to find me and all that stuff. Awesome. Thanks, well, man, man, thank you so much for everything uh, that you did. Thanks, obviously, for the work that you did in Israel and helping all those people that needed help. And thank you for sharing everything that you shared today, brother. Really, Thanks, really man. appreciate it. Thanks. And thank you so Let's much for everyone who, for listening. I do appreciate it.